and welcome to Director's Cut. This will be the last Director's Cut for this week, but we've saved the best to last because one of the things about camp meeting that is special is always the music. It's true in our churches as well, and that is why in the North England Conference we have Diana as a music director, and in the South we have Paul Lee. Both of you welcome to Director's Cut. Thank you, Thank you. People have been complimenting the music this week. There have been a few brick bats thrown as well, I'm, I'm sure, and, and you've received those. Maybe we should just start off by saying, how do you select the music that comes here at Camp Meeting? Maybe Diana first. Um, well, I wanted to mention the theme song in particular, because Paul and I had been talking about Camp Meeting once we knew it was a, a joint project. And we actually had a songwriter's retreat in February, which... Well, we had some of our specialists, those who are particularly interested in this aspect of music ministry, that have written a song specifically for our camp meeting based on Adventist doctrine, you know, the theme of revival. And so I'm kind of pleased to see that being used here. But Are, are you hearing people humming it as they walk around the site? Yes, I think to some extent, um, I think that's true. Uh, I think it has been well received. I've had some, some positive comments about it. But it was written by a group of people, which I think is the way to go for congregational singing. And um, the, 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 the praise team and those who have been leading out of, in it have been saying how, how much they have enjoyed it. Um, there's a lot of forward planning that goes on that you don't see here. And, and, you know, I'm always amazed when people come, at, at, you know, 30 minutes before the final concert and say, oh, I'd like to sing, and not aware of the months and months of planning. But we try to encourage best practice across the board, and we try to um, show representation of the different types of music, the different types of musicians that we have, and, and, and put our best forward for camp meeting. So does that mean there's always going to be something I'll like and always something that's going to challenge me a bit? Definitely, I yeah. would say, definitely. Okay, and, and, and Paul, you've, you've got the privilege because Diana's role in the North is, is a voluntary one. Right. Um, the South actually throws a few crumbs of money at you they from time to do. time. Yep. Um, <laughs> but you, you've been very much involved with camp meeting for many yes. years in, yes. in, in the South. Mm. And what she says about the forward planning is very important, isn't it? It's absolutely imperative for camp meeting. Camp meeting is the highlight in a lot of people's years and certainly in the church year as being the uh, single point of reference uh, that we where we come away and have some kind of spiritual retreat and recharge our spiritual batteries. So it's really important that the music that is surrounding that has been chosen and well rehearsed and, and well put together for such an occasion. Now let, let's move out of the camp meeting bit more to your, your general roles in, in the churches. Adventists have always enjoyed music. You look in our hymn book, you've got the early Adventist hymns, mm. and we've now moved on into other hymns and contemporary worship. If you ever want to have a riot in church, you start talking about music. Um, so you haven't gone prematurely grey, it's just the music debates. How, how do you deal, you know, in, in the role as music coordinator, how do you deal with the diversity of music within Adventism and within Christianity in general so that our members know that they're worshipping and we don't have riots? Mm. Well, I think one really important point is to recognise that we're all different. Um, there are different music styles and genres, uh, different ways of doing things, and we have to celebrate the diversity of the different, um, uh, even culture groups that we have within the church. And we're, we are an international church, and even within our, our, our small part of this territory of the world, um, we have such a diverse range that it's very, very hard for us to prescribe exactly what people should do or how they should worship. But what we do is we celebrate the richness of the cultures that we have. I, I, I like the word celebrate. We'll still come back though, and I know somebody's going to come and talk to me after they're, they're watching us live now, and they're going to say, but pastor, isn't there a bottom line? I think you can say, yes, there is a bottom line. And, um, you know, to, to a certain amount, there is this interpretation. I fully support what Paul has said. And in fact, in our discussion today, we had a music workshop where we spent some time discussing more or less the interpretation of the guidelines for a philosophy of Seventh-day Adventist music that the GC puts out. Anyone can go to the GC website, they can read this document for, for themselves. There are a number of, of scriptural passages 
that we can refer to as musicians. And some people seem to think that there's something different about music that all the Bible principles don't apply. Well, I'm sorry, all the Bible principles still do apply. But on the local church level, it's important for the local musicians to work with the leadership and with their congregation to bring that group into worship together. But if, I mean, when I go into a church, and obviously in my role I'm preaching in a different church across the British Isles, right through the year and, and some churches you go in and it's, it's very traditional and it's the Adventist hymn book if not the new Advent hymnal in other churches you go in and the guitars and the drum kits and everything are, are there there's, there's, there's a great variety there is that okay? You know, is, is worship worship and it doesn't matter whether it's traditional or contemporary how, how do we enhance it? I think that we should celebrate that variety um, none of us know what music there is going to be in heaven but we know what worship is. And I think that um, if we can stick to our biblical principles and make sure that those who are leading out in music are properly prepared, that they're spiritual people, that they understand what some of these issues and concerns are, and they are not doing music for themselves, but bringing the congregation into worship, then I don't think we should have any problems. Now, I know within your role, you've, you've run songwriters' workshops, yes. you've run children's music workshops. Mm -hmm. so is, is something similar to that? happening in the south absolutely, absolutely. Um, for a number of years now we've had the Dalbert Alliance Music Awards and that's um, the forerunner of that of course is the, is the music competition and we also resurrected three years ago the uh, Children's Festival of Praise and again that will be happening uh, alongside that we have a number of workshops and things including um, an orchestral um, master class uh, this year we're having one in three days in um, in August, um, run by Tina Brooks, Chris Rogers, and a number of people from across the whole union. Um, so what we're doing is we're working from bottom up in teaching our children and giving them the, the biblical principles, the musical principles, but also to um, celebrate what we have and to resurrect to a greater extent traditional instrumentation, which seems to have sort of been thrown out with the, uh, with the bathwater. Yeah, we, we don't know how to sing in harmony in church anymore, do we? Because we all look at the PowerPoint on the screen and don't, don't have the music hymn book in front of us. Is it? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, Victor, because um, we did have Chris Williams talking about the whole copyright situation and how music has changed over the years. So we can't ignore that. We have to accept that there have been changes in the way that we do music, if you like. I, I know that for many choirs, it's difficult to get people to practice regularly. But there are still things that we can do and, and still principles that we can make sure are maintained across the board. But I think it's time for some new initiatives, perhaps using technology more. Um, we're t we've been talking about publishing a new hymn book for us here within the North England Conference that would incorporate a music notation, um, perhaps tonic solfa, so our, our African brethren can read it easily, and perhaps an audio recording as well. Okay, and, and you just mentioned North England Conference, and the last thing I was going to ask, you know, because we, we have this combined event, yes. is, is the music department north and south, or are, are, we, are we working together? Are there kind of joint events, initiatives happening? Yes, there are joint events, because I mentioned the, um, the theme song, that was a joint initiative, and Paul and I have known each other for many, many years, and um, it's nice when you have people working who have the same focus, that is for us to encourage the membership to reach a standard of excellence and to work together, and we put on a number of, of different training events and, and, and other things that, that we do work together. Even if we're not working together, we still will talk. <laughs> you still Talk with each other. Yes, okay. we do on, on a regular basis. Yes. Yes. So you you see music moving forward within the Adventist Church within the British Isles. Absolutely, without a question of a doubt. Without music, you don't really have a service, and and uh, a lot of people don't actually really recognise that music actually plays the largest part in a service. So it's imperative that you know we work together to make sure that the principles are in place and that we um, move towards excellence. Brilliant. Well, thank you both very much because I know this is an extremely busy week and we had to drag yeah. you here I was going to say kicking and screaming but it was singing really uh, and you're going straight from here to, to organize the rest of the weekend's programs thank you so much for spending time on director's cuts much appreciated so that that was the music department and you can see that their department is important vital in fact, we now move from music to communication. 
And, and some people in the past always said communication is, you know, you have your nominating committee and you start with your list, you start with the first elder at the top and then you work down the list and eventually after three hours you get to the communication. Oh, is there some old lady somewhere that could maybe do this for us? That's not the world anymore, is it? You know, Je Jeff and, and Richard here, the two communication and stewardship directors for the North and the South England conferences. Is that the way it still works, Richard? We're being held together by you at the BUC. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't work that you, way. You've declared the bias now. <laughs> no, we, 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 we don't work that way anymore. We use, try to choose the best as, as we can for the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So, you know, at the end of the day, communication is very important um, because we are the ones that communicate for the rest of the departments and for the conference. So it's very important to choose someone who has the requisite skills for communication. And, and I think that's one of the things, isn't it, that communication, actually a lot of it happens on the local church level and, and it's your role and, and my role to try and encourage that communication to happen better. What, what's happening up in the north, Jeff? Tell, tell us about communication up there. Well, basically, we've been working with you, um, facilitating and accessing the Net Adventist um, program so that all our churches can be on the web because our young people and most of our modern age is based around the media and young people live on Facebook and on the internet and so we have to make sure that they and their generation are able to hear the message and access the message using the media that they are um, familiar with. And, and there's been quite a successful take up in the North and, and in the South up, yes. England Conference as yes. well with the websites. They do look better than they did five years Indeed, ago. Indeed they do. Okay, and we're and, grateful. To, and our church be, signage yeah. is, is one thing you've been pushing. And um, there's, there's an improvement in some of the looks of the signs on the churches. What do communication people do? Are, are you just sitting in a rocking chair most of the day and occasionally you do a bit of news? As you know, news never sleeps. 24-hour rolling news is exactly the same with the church. If anything breaks, as communications director, we have to respond to that. Whether it be a crisis, whether it be public relations, whatever that might be, we've got to respond. So as much as there's 24-hour rolling news, your communications director are always there to news gather as well as to report the news. Okay, we're going to move on to your other hat in a moment, but... While you are the communication directors, both of you, you also have with you a media team. And I, I know this, this is where there's a disparity in size and resources, north and although yes, the indeed. North has got a proposal in to try and compensate for that. Mm -hmm. um, very, very briefly, what's, what's the South doing with media? We're grateful to God for what he has done for us over the past four years. We have an outside broadcasting unit. We have at least 15 volunteers. We're live streaming here from camp meeting. Um, we're about to go on Revelation TV, um, Sky 581, Freesat 692, and with a two hour or an hour program um, starting on the 4th of July. And uh, we signed a contract for six months, three months rather, going on possibly for six months. And uh, so we're taking communication to another level. And so that's what, that's what we've been doing in South England Conference. And, and I like the fact that you've mentioned a lot of that, while there are paid staff that are sure. involved, there's a lot of very committed volunteers, all of whom are standing behind cameras around here at the moment or are back in the van. Sure. This whole live stream, this whole process at camp meeting wouldn't happen without them. Definitely wouldn't happen, to, and you know, as personal ministries, personal ministries, as communication director, that's another hat that I used to wear, and, um, and, you loved <laughs> and, I, and I loved it. Um, but as communication director, I'm grateful to the volunteers. It would not have happened without the volunteers. As I said, we have 15 volunteers so far, and the team is growing. I have a young man from the Wimbledon Church, and he now goes to the Hampstead Church. Greg, who's interested in media. And his father contacted me last week and said, is there anything that you can find for him to do? He said, yes, bring him up to camp meeting. And so he's operating cameras. He's in the, in the outside broadcasting unit right now um, looking at what we do there. So there's opportunities for our young people who are into media to come on board and be volunteers for SEC Media. Excellent. And, and, and while, as we said, the SEC Media has, has taken a leap ahead and is doing a fantastic job, the North is, is not without media. We, we do see product coming in from there. Yes. And, and tell, tell me very briefly, th there's a proposal going forward. I don't know if it's gone to your executive committee. No, Maybe we yet. shouldn't even mention it yet. No, it hasn't gone to the executive committee. But fundamentally, we are saying that we are seeking to showcase um, our mission and our message. And we are using volunteers as happens in the north in the south because we cannot pay people 
But again, we have lots of committed, talented people who work in that field who are prepared to give time and resources to give their creative ability so we can develop these these programs and showcase them to spread our message. Yeah, I, I saw a great little video program come out of the Adventurer Campery just, just last week at the last bank holiday. Yes. Nice piece of work, all done by volunteers. Of course, um, because at least our young people are working in this area and we give them the um, facilities and the opportunities to develop their gifts so that they can spread the word. Okay, excellent. Let's switch hats. Could, could I just oh. mention, could I just mention, as much as we do have volunteers, um, we do give them expenses, so we don't want to su suggest that there no expenses are given, that they're volunteering their time without any remuneration, but we do give them. Um, they are the ones responsible for the two programs we're producing on Sky, and uh, they're the ones that, if, if it were not for them, then there's no way we could have produced a dark room or focus on the future. As I said before, it would be broadcast on the 4th of July um, on Freesat 692 and on Sky 5. And we do appreciate the, in, the enthusiasm that we see with them and the skills that they bring to the job. Okay, the last part of Director's Cut for camp meeting. Again, it's one of those jobs that sometimes comes down near the bottom of the list when the nominating committee is working. And yet, in the days that we live in, with the world as it is, stewardship in every aspect of our lives is vitally important. You both wear that hat as well. Indeed. Jeff, tell me what's happening with stewardship in the North. When we talk about stewardship, first things people think, oh, he's after my money. But as you... Now, that's the presumption, yes. <laughs> but as you so ably said, stewardship is the management of the, every aspect of our lives. And therefore, yes, we talk about money, we focus on money, but we're talking about whole life stewardship. Therefore, in, in the North, we challenge our membership to get involved in evangelism. And so we, we see our young people involved in the task force and other areas of our work. And then also we challenge our people to not just think about now, but that when they leave here, they must make sure that they leave something behind to continue the mission and the, uh, and, and the purpose that they have the church here for. So we challenge them to give money in their wills or as living wills or whatever to access and to advance the work. And that's one of the things that we are doing very well. And in this financially very strapping time, we are amazed at the fact that our tithe income has increased by near 9%. And we, I, I am impressed by that, that we, we see our members being laid off and reduced hours, reduced wages, and, and yet they are so faithful. And, 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 and we simply thank God and we simply commend them for their faithfulness because they believe in the mission and they put their money and their time and their, uh, and their talents where, the, where their belief is. Okay, we gave the North first opportunity on that and I, I know you've written a whole book on the subject Richard <laughs> we, we don't have time for the whole book but t tell me what can you add because everything Jeff said about the north I'm sure is true for the south all of the above all of the above I think the only thing is is that money follows mission if people have a vision of a particular mission they will give money case in point in terms of the gift aid we've had a tremendous um, amount of money coming through gift aid over the past two years in fact the highest amount of money coming in ever since the inception of gift aid because of promotion. Churches need buildings, they need churches renovated, they need various missionary activities within their local church. They know that can be done if they sign up to gift aid. And because you can get now 25 pence in the pound back as opposed to 28 pence in the pound back, and we can only now go back four years, members have signed up. If you know that you can buy your church building it be paid off in the next five or ten years by your gift aid alone, then why not sign up to gift aid? I think that's one of the main things that we've been pushing in the South and it's been tremendous. And, and what we can see in a sense, I mean, it, it affects stewardship and also communications, personal ministries, all of these things in a sense converge together. If we don't communicate properly, then how does the gospel get out there? If we haven't got God's good stewardship, how do we finance sure. it? How do we resource it with people that are stewarding their time as the volunteers we've just talked about? Well, I always say to my treasurer, Earl Ram Harak Singh, that I'm the departmental director that not only spends money, but makes money. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've brought more money into the conference, I think over the past three or four years, at least £400,000 through gift aid, new gift aid that has come in. So I not only spend money, but I also make money for the church. 
And what he says for the South is so true for the North in that we've seen amazing take-up on gift, gift aid and people are happy when they see the benefit that comes back to their own congregations and to their own mission. So if, if they're not on gift aid, they've never heard about gift aid, what do they do? They contact you, they contact the office? They contact their local um, treasurer who will give them the form or they contact the office directly or they can even go online and download a form. So let me clear up, this will be the last question on stewardship, let me just clear up this gift aid thing once and for all. Am I taking money from the government to do God's work? Yes, essentially. The government is giving money back to the local church for God's work. I mean, essentially all you need to do is sign the dotted line. If you're a taxpayer, the government will give us back at least four years of what your giving record, 25 pence in the pound to do God's work. It's your money anyway. It's your money. You pay your taxes. It's just coming back in a different form to do God's work. So my tax gets spent on doing the church's work rather than maybe supporting the military or something well, else? We, you know, as much as we pay tax and the government does what they want with the taxes, they've given us this opportunity of having the work done because the government knows we're the troops on the ground. We know what the lay of the land is and therefore we can do the work far better than the government can. So they allow us to do the work and they just give us the opportunity and the benefit of having the gift day to do that. So some of our members might argue, you know, we shouldn't be tied in to things that the government's doing. You know, there's, 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 there's the Babylon arc. Well, this is, this is a follow-on because you didn't, didn't necessarily fully, as fully as I wanted you to. So it was the last question to you. I'll, I'll, let, I'll, let, Jeff, I'll let Jeff ask the hard, answer the hard oh, question. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You know, aren't we buying into Babylon, Jeff, to, uh, to take this money from, from the government's coffers? In the end, whose money is it anyway? It is God's money. God has made us stewards, and if the government... Historically, the charitable work has been done in our culture by the church, whether it was schools or hospitals and so on. And the, and the government has seen that when charities spend the money, um, it costs them much, much less um, in their outgoing. So they are not... They are, they are doing it out of self-interest by giving us this money to do. The, the one danger, though, is that we need to make sure that we do not get ourselves in a situation where we become so dependent upon this money that one of these days, when it is cut from underneath us, we are left high and dry. That, so, so we need to be, our members need to be wider in their concept of loyalty to giving to the mission of the church. So the gift aid should always be an added extra. Yes. He, he said he didn't want to say anymore, and I can see that hand wagging there. There is, there is also a danger of hoarding money. I think a lot of churches get money back from gift aid and sit on it. So they come to the board meeting and say, Pastor, we have X amount of hundreds of thousands of pounds in the bank, which is gift aid money, but they're not utilizing the money. And so when the Lord comes, they'll say, Lord, look at, look at what we've got in the bank account. But God doesn't want the money then. He wants us to utilize the money that we have. It's for public benefit. And so therefore, those churches around the conferences that are hoarding money, that's not supposed to be the point of gift aid. Gift aid is to be spent for the mission and the message of the church in wherever you are located. Excellent. I think we've got that message across. And thank you both very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Richard, because you organized Director's Cuts this, this year. And thank you to the team of volunteers and, and Stefan in particular, who is the one paid employee on, on, on the team that's running it this year. Thank you to everyone that has helped make Director's Cut a success. And to you for watching it and learning maybe a little bit more about what the various directors, North and South, are doing to help you bring people to Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching.